My name is Adam Yurominko. I'm the founder of Zero Tier and the author of the Core Engine, and I'm here to give you a technical deep dive on how this actually works under the hood. Um, I have uh, some slides here that introduce the basic concepts and show how things work, and then I assume there's probably going to be a good amount of Q&A in this one. No. So it is a layered architecture. Um, in a previous section, I actually went over this at a high level. Um, zero tiers organized into two layers internally. These are logically separate, but they're implemented as part of the same code base internally, so they play nice together. Um, there is a network virtualization protocol running over a peer-to-peer -peer protocol. So the peer-to-peer -peer protocol takes care of moving packets back and forth between nodes, and that's its job. It also takes care of encryption, it takes care of authentication, and it provides a cryptographic uh, infrastructure that the next layer can use for authentication and security. Um, VL1 is what we call the planetary wire closet. Um, because the idea is imagine everybody's got an invisible ethernet cable to a smart switch somewhere. That's the abstraction that it provides at a higher level. The next layer is called VL2. It is not VXLAN, but it is conceptually similar in what it does. It gives you a smart configurable um, with a rules engine, flow control, all these kinds of things, emulated ethernet network that acts pretty much exactly like a physical ethernet network. And then within VL2, you can run layer three and up just normally. All right, the, um, so VL1, like I said, encrypted and authenticated, cryptographically addressed. This is one of those concepts that would be familiar to the people from the peer-to-peer -peer networking world, um, might be less familiar to people from the enterprise networking world. Um, that means that your public key is used to derive your global address. And what that means is I know, I know who I'm talking to, or at least I'm talking either to you or to somebody who hacked you and stole your key. Um, by the way, that, that is obviously a weakness here. If someone steals your key, they can pretend to be you. Um, technology roadmap. I'm working these into the whole thing. Um, support for hardware HSMs is on the technology roadmap. That's nice. Um, right now, it's just a file that's locked down. Um, responsibilities, it establishes peer-to-peer -peer connectivity. If you lose the link, it reestablishes um, and does authentication. Uh, so I have a little, little mini animation here of how this peer-to-peer -peer protocol works. A lot of people in a previous section commented on how, how well it works. Um, we get peer-to-peer -peer success rates of upwards of 90 to 95 percent. Um, it works from airplanes. It works on crummy routers that are like hanging under the table at a coffee shop, uh, you know, stuff like this. Actually, side note, enterprise NATs are often buggier than consumer NATs. I don't, I don't know why, but because um, you pay more for them. Maybe that's why. Uh, <laughs> you pay more for those bugs. They're chewy. Um, okay, so you got two nodes and they want to talk. Now, another way of looking at what VL1 does is IP, uh, you couldn't do this without IP. IP routes packets to places. So this hotel has one or more IP addresses. And if I send a packet to that IP, it's going to arrive <clears throat> at the hotel. Who's at the hotel? I don't know, but it's going to arrive at the hotel. VL1 addresses say who it is, but not where it is. So if Alice has Bob's VL1 address um, and they want to talk, Alice has no idea if Bob is on a plane or next to her. So they have to find each other. Um, that uses one or more what are called roots. We call them roots. Uh, they're also called planets in, in older documentation. We're trying to get away from that terminology because I thought people would find it less confusing. They find it more confusing. Um, Roots, uh, we, the term is by analogy to DNS root name servers. Um, you can think of this as real-time peer-to-peer establishing analog of DNS. Um, Alice maintains a connection to Roots. Bob maintains a connection to Roots. Alice sends a message to Bob. She looks up Bob's whole secret key from, her addre from uh, his address. She can do that. Roots also cache keys. Um, and then she can make a packet, encrypt it, address it, and send it. She has nowhere to send it, so she sends it to the root. 
the root sends it to Bob. Great, now they're talking. And this is why when you start using zero tier, if you ping, it works right away. And then you'll see the uh, latency drop. The latency drops when the peer to peer connection gets established. Initially, you're bouncing through something, which is a lot slower. Now, the next thing that happens is, yep, she sends a packet to Bob. The root forwards the packet. It's end to end encrypted. The root uh, knows nothing other than that Alice and Bob want to talk to each other. The root doesn't even know what virtual network they're on. VL2 is separate. Um, all it sees is that they are talking. However, the root notices that Alice and Bob want to talk. So it actually sends them uh, some information about each other's and their own location on the network, uh, along with forwarding that packet to help them establish a connection. In addition, Alice and Bob, because they have an indirect link, can send each other information uh, under the hood about, hey, I'm Alice, here's where I think I is. Here's where I think I am. The roots where is like, here's where she looks like she is from my point of view. Then they can run, actually, this is standard UDP hole punching. Um, it actually tries about four or five different tricks to, to make uh, direct connections. Uh, then they can send packets this way, make a direct UDP connection. Once that's done, they don't need the root anymore unless they lose that connection. So if the root, you know, I don't know, went down for a second um, or was just unreachable, they're gonna continue to talk over their peer-to-peer -peer connection. The root also can't see anything. One of the ways we're able to scale zero tier so big is we don't backhaul all the traffic. Um, you know, it all goes peer-to-peer. -peer. We are not, um, we are just providing metadata to make that happen. And then, uh, yeah, so that's that's basically what VL1 does. There's a lot of extra stuff over the hood. It tries alternate ports. Um, it uh, it uses UPnP, uses NAT PMP, uses IPv6 if that's available because IPv6 works better because you don't really have NAT in the way. Or there are some some weird people who like to put NAT on IPv6, but then at least it's one to one NAT, which means that the NAT mapping never runs out of ports, which uh, that makes it work better. You said you don't backhaul all of the traffic, but also said that sometimes point to point links don't establish. Uh huh. So if those, so you you do the initial traffic, right? Yeah, if and actually, TTP we do provide, never comes up. We we do um, we do provide right now at least through our root infrastructure and if you run your own uh you can do this yourself we we will relay the traffic but it's rate limited so it's going to be kind of slow so you will get a little sip straw of traffic uh for free uh, if you can't make a peer-to-peer -peer connection that's for people that are on crummy or lockdown networks so at least it works um yeah um one of the reason there's demand uh, for people to host federated routes is some people want to host their own dedicated routes for that purpose um, to make that faster. Because obviously we can't give everyone full speed on that uh, or it would, you know. By the way, our global route infrastructure that we run is hosted at four different ISPs on four different data centers adjacent to uh, carrier hotels uh, on four different continents. So, uh, and it's a shared nothing architecture. So all four of, any one of those could handle the whole network. So all four of them would have to go down at once to have an outage. Um, that's never happened. So um, barring alien invasion or nuclear war, it's probably okay. Um, so VL2, um, ethernet emulation layer, it's kind of similar to VXLAN. Uh, it is an SDN. So, you know, this thing's a sandwich. It's got a peer-to-peer -peer network with SDN on top of it. That's the cheese, I guess, on the, on the patty. Um, emulates layer two and then uses VL1's cryptographic uh, infrastructure to define VLAN boundaries with certificates. When you join a zero tier virtual network, if you look at, okay, this is kind of a, oh, it didn't, Port quite right, quite right. This is um, this is kind of a cheat sheet of concepts. When you join a zero tier virtual network, um, if you look at, you have this long network ID. Here's one from the demo that we did. The first ten digits of this are the zero tier address of the network controller. The rest of that is the number of the network on the controller. the The controller is just a zero tier node, and so when you join a network, it asks the controller, "Hey, hello." Um, 
give me a certificate, give me um, a configuration for this network. It's either going to go, hey, get lost. I don't know who you are. Or it's going to give you that. And then you can present that to the other nodes to talk to them, just like any other PKI cert system. Um, what that means is uh, you, with uh, the network controllers, the communication is inbound via, in band via VL1, which means that it's really easy to do high availability there. Um, the network controllers are also logically separate from the roots. So if they, and if they go down, the things that are already on the network talking will continue to talk. You just can't make changes to your network or add things that have been offline for a long time if your network controller is down. So these are not really like hot single points of failure. You don't want them to go down, but it doesn't kill everything if they go down. Um, and then, uh, yeah, these are some of the, the, the core concepts that you'll run into if you read zero tier docs. They're, they're included there. You've got addresses, identities, which is the address with its public keys. It's derived from node, network ID, network, network controller, all the rest of this. On uh, multi-factor authentication. Um, mm -hmm. I know it's been talked about before. Where are you guys at on that? So um, we, are, we are very, very close. Uh, one of the next big items on our roadmap is um, open ID support at the edge device. So when I join a network, um, you know, it, a lot of customers, this is particularly important for the VPN use case in a corporate environment, um, less important for like multi-cloud because nobody's going to walk in and off on a, a rack machine in a cloud. But um, when you join a network, it would require you to do MFA locally to gain access to that network. And then you could require it periodically. That's um, really close in our roadmap. It's actually like a, something, go ahead. Like a YubiKey, you could do a YubiKey. You could do a YubiKey. You could also do federated login. You could do like Okta, Google, Okta. Um, right. stuff like that. Anything that speaks open ID. Um, later in the roadmap, uh, we've had some requests for SAML, so we might do that. Um, but yeah, that's, that's definitely on the roadmap. It's one of the next major things. Um, so quick question on the controller portion when the controller goes mm -hmm. offline. Yeah. What's the what's the lifetime for the existing sessions that'll stay up, and then secondarily, uh, the state information within the controller if it completely clears out mm -hmm. for any given yeah. reason, what what, do you, what does it take to reestablish? So the controllers don't have a lot of state information, um, and they uh, they can talk to either a local in file system database or Postgres, which is how we do it. So they actually keep it there. Um, okay. the The machines that are communicating now would actually continue to communicate forever. Um, so the way it works is each cert has a timestamp that also defines a window of other certs it will agree with. Okay. Um, so if everybody's got a cert, they're not getting any updates because the, the controller's dead. Right, they're going to so continue. They're all, moving forward. they're all moving forward at the same rate. They're all moving That's forward right. at the same time. Right. So if, the con if somebody has been offline for longer than that window, they won't be able to talk because they can't get a cert. When the controller comes back, everyone will get new certs. So, okay. so, uh, so, so yeah. that's the non-dependency part because the, it'll generate yeah. a new cert on the controller side. Okay. Yeah, the controller generates certs automatically when you ask it for one if you're allowed on the network. Got it. Mm -hmm. Putting my uh, you know, enterprise security hat on for a minute, um, you mentioned you know standard tricks for UDP punching and things like that, um, things that probably make most enterprise firewall admins cringe a little bit. Um, you know, from a shadow IT perspective, you know, uh, obviously there are mechanisms in place, I assume, that uh, we can implement that would prevent people from just installing this on their workstation and their home computers in order to mm. gain access to to resources within their network. And just from a compliance perspective, mm -hmm. um, just understanding that, you know, your average user isn't just punching holes in your firewall to get back right. to their home network. Um, that's, a, that's actually a good question. Um, first of all, what we do for hole punching uh, there's actually a lot of stuff we don't do. We could get close to a 99% success rate, but we would set off intrusion detection systems. So we avoid, we avoid doing tactics for IPv4 NAT hole punching that are going to set off IDSs. Um, every once in a while, somebody reports that it actually did set off an IDS, but not very often. Um, the rest of your question, so if your network is open to, uh, to UDP outbound, 
then they could use zero tier or anything else, including WebRTC and stuff like that to remotely access a machine on their net on your network. If that's locked down, then zero tier is not going to work. So, um, yeah, so you're not the only ones yeah. doing this. So obviously, if you're already sort of no. protected from some no. of those other products, then this no. isn't a concern. No, we Was didn't invent. We didn't invent hole punching for peer to peer. <laughs> that's been around since the the early 2000s, actually. Right. I believe we just did a a pretty solid implementation of it. Have you guys Have you guys played around with thinking about doing you know poking holes for proxy access for things like DNS tunneling and and things like that, or you know, or doing. Uh, you know, oh, oh. Um, so, are you asking about other techniques we could use for proxy access? Yeah, for payload transport, right? You could do oh. it over a DNS message type with 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 standard dot and do methods, right? Oh, so, yeah. Um, so, like I said, we do want to avoid methods that will make security people freak out and like jump out of bed and drive to the office. Well, dot and do, uh, dot, you know, dot <laughs> and do already. You know, I mean, you know, Firefox yeah. already made that decision for everyone. So, yeah, so. that's true. That's true. Um, you know, we could, uh, I have looked at using ICMP uh, as a transport. I mm -hmm. have looked at using, uh, I hadn't actually looked at DNS lately. I'll have to look at that. Um, other things that are on our longer term technology roadmap, uh, and this isn't in the area of hole punching, but it's in the area of use inside a data center or inside a building. Um, we have plans to support just naked ethernet transport. So uh, that would reduce overhead a bit when you're uh, talking to machines and would also make it easier to, um, to run it on a machine and use one of those uh, skip the kernel uh, zero copy like DP, <laughs> DPDK type stacks or something. Right. Uh, right. We have a lot of stuff were, were on our technology. Gonna, yeah. Would you yeah. end up doing a new ether type for that? <laughs> yeah, it would be a new ethernet ether type. Yeah. It would be zero yeah, yeah. tiers ether, ether type. Um, right. We have a lot of stuff on our tech roadmap that's about getting uh, much higher performance out of this thing um, and taking advantage of things like um, like accelerators and you know zero copy networking and stuff like that. Right now, the performance you get is going to be faster than anybody's internet connection, but we have some people that are interested in using this inside as an SDN technology, in which case we would need to do a lot better than that. I was actually going to ask you about the performance uh, angle uh -huh. of that, Adam, because yeah. the um, you, you guys recently partnered with Microtik and you know you yeah. can get on a Microtik routers now. Mm -hmm. I, I know you can't speak for Microtik, but as it relates to the ARM and ARM64 platforms, mm -hmm. you know, knowing what kind of hardware they're using, you know, what, what do you see? And, and also they've got, uh, they're using normal mm -hmm. Prestera ASICs. Um, mm -hmm. Any possibility for this to go into an ASIC or, you know, what do you see as kind of the performance um, mm -hmm. uh, possibilities there just on that architecture? So the existing version of zero tier, um, it, the encryption it uses uh, is, is based on AES-256. So it does take advantage of crypto acceleration in the chip. I know ChaCha is kind of hip right now. Um, ChaCha is gonna perform a lot better than AES if you don't have crypto acceleration, but AES absolutely smokes it if you do, because it's hardware. Um, most things that have ARM64 in them, except unfortunately the Raspberry Pi, but just about every router we've seen and every phone has uh, AES crypto extensions, uh, including all the Microtik stuff. Um, and obviously server and desktop and laptop chips do. Um, the performance that we get ranges from, now I don't have the Microtik numbers handy, um, but on things like uh, things like servers and laptops, it ranges from anywhere from uh, 800 megabit up to two gigabit kind of speeds uh, without doing anything special. You know, the, the packet overhead is comparable to something like IPsec. Gotcha. And I think if I remember right, I, there are some people that are doing some 10 gig plus stuff on it as well. That, that's there what are, they've actually done some crazy hacks to do that. Like, um, like, getting in and hacking the code to make it talk through things like DPDK. Yep. Uh, and uh, people have done stuff like that. Um, we plan on doing some of that stuff. I mean, some of that stuff's on our technology roadmap as officially supported or standard ways of doing things. We also, um, we can do some work just internally to optimize, um, just code optimization to make it go faster. Great, thank you. Have mm -hmm. you seen people have you seen people do things like, you know, containerize, you know, FRR and use multiple zero tier connections at the same time to route between for, 
for services. Yeah. Just so um, that's that's one Docker and Kubernetes use case. Sometimes you see. Sometimes people will deploy it like that. Um, and it's also it's smart enough that if it's on the same machine, it will you it'll end up using the same machine's IP address to talk to itself. And uh, it'll still though do the uh, encapsulation and everything. So yeah, you know, we have. We have seen people do that. Whether the performance matters or not to you, of course, depends very much on what your workload is. You know, sometimes the performance that we have is is way below what you're going to need. Sometimes people push it. You know, right? Have you seen people do stuff like you know using like distributed Calico for BGP with you guys as an underlay like that? Mm, I've never heard of that, but uh, it sounds like something that would be possible. Um, like I said, we also have a lot of dev work. Our devs right now are um, looking into a lot of things we could do in the Kubernetes ecosystem. One of the things that's held us back there, one of them is time. You know, we're not a, a billion dollar company. Uh, the other one is um, we have a little bit of a analysis paralysis with uh, Kubernetes because there's so many different things we could do in the Kubernetes ecosystem. So. We are working on some ideas and our plan is to put them out there and then work with the community and refine them, you know? Yeah, the, ser the service discovery side along with mm -hmm. your DNS service could be really, really interesting in terms, yeah. of, in terms of building distributed I, cluster. Yeah, cluster I do know that a lot of the complexity of setting up, if you want to self-host Kubernetes, a lot of the complexity is actually in the networking. And I know at a small scale, um, if you want to self-host Kubernetes, you can take advantage of the fact that everything's just L2 adjacent and right. you could set up a production cluster in the same way you would set up a demo cluster with a bunch of stuff on the same LAN. So uh, you can do that kind of thing. Beyond that, um, we have some work going on on, on integrations uh, with Kubernetes, with the Kubernetes ecosystem. Seven minutes, or tell you what, I'll ask you a pretty general one. Mm -hmm. um, how are you making your money? Ah, good question. So we actually have three things right now. Um, one of them is the SaaS. Another one is, um, so the way the license is, if you put it in a proprietary product, you have to get a commercial license. So we have some of that going on. And then we also have a budding professional services uh, kind, of, uh, kind of thing going on because um, what we find a lot of times as with any new technology, when we onboard people, there's a learning curve and then after a while they don't need any help because they've they've learned how it works and they've figured it out. Um, we did have somebody joke with us that we're doing enterprise wrong because our product actually works and what we should do is make it require constant attention so we can constantly do the professional services, but I don't want to do that. So do yeah. That yeah, no. Okay. <laughs> Just ask for a big enterprise license up front for a 10 year agreement and then just yeah, make it work yeah. and walk away. Yeah, pretty much actually. Uh, that that <laughs> we, we did have a customer say once that like I, I sent out, we sent out some emails. This was a while ago asking people how it was going. And somebody said, it's great. I, I forgot I was using it. I've talked to a lot of companies that have very wildly differing models of feature addition. There are some that you cannot get a feature added to that product until a critical mass of their customers mm -hmm. or users mm -hmm. are either asking for it, demanding it, or create a black project mm -hmm. to install it on GitHub and then force you to put it in your product. Mm -hmm. And then there are other ones. Um, they tend to wear black turtlenecks and jeans, and they say, um, I'm going to do this with the product, and if you don't like that, hit the door. I'm hoping that your model is somewhere in the middle. I would say it is somewhere in the middle. Which yeah. do you give more credence to? Do you give more credence to the community kind of sourcing you for features that they'd like to see? Uh -huh. Or do you and your development team kind of have a more like visionary approach to say, we really want it to do this and that's where we want to take the model? Both at the same time. And I think that the way that works is, um, so what I don't want is um, one, of our, one of our goals is we want to radically simplify networking. So we do not want to create a feature Christmas tree uh, or contribute to one of the things we want to kill is what I call the enterprise network uh, Rube Goldberg machine, you know, where you've got the network diagram with all the things in it and the, the mouse runs into the cage and makes the cat chase it and then, and then your firewall opens and, you know, we don't want to do that. Uh, so what we want to do is we want to listen to our community and learn what they need to do with this and then that has to get elevated up to to conceptual thought about 
how should we do this in the way that is the most elegant with the least complexity in our ecosystem and then work features in in that way and we do do a little bit of waiting as people request features because if you collect a whole lot of feedback sometimes you can figure out one feature that does something for a whole lot of different people and um, I really like that. In fact, the whole product itself is that, you know, the whole thesis of, um, for example, you know, multi cloud and VPN and all these other things are the same thing. It's because they, they kind of are, they're special cases of being able to do a software defined network. I have stuff that wants to talk. I want to tell, tell the stuff to talk. I think the way the, the way networking should be done in the 21st century is I want that and that to talk click click done. That's that's the way it should work. You need to put that on a t shirt. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> I like to connect all the things but that's yeah. oh, thank you. That, mm -hmm. I love that answer is all right. It's a little bit of both but you're still very much. Yeah, we we here. got to listen, but I don't want to feature Christmas tree so. You know, I also like um, the fact that it is open source, it is an open ecosystem, and you can do a lot of stuff with it. We want to make hooks where people can make their own stuff and put it on GitHub, and we don't think that's bad. Um, if you search zero tier on GitHub, you'll find a bunch of stuff. People have even made third party consoles for hosting your own controller. Uh, you know, that's fine, you know. <laughs> yeah. Can you say a little bit about? segmentation so assuming um, I'm in a company mm -hmm. I operate a company network and all my employees are connected to the network and then a guest comes and he also wants to use my Wi-Fi mm -hmm. how do you segment that so it's network virtualization so the idea here is the or, or zero trust we have a new buzzword um, the uh, the physical network isn't trusted and so if I were greenfielding this and installing it in a building I would just wire the building for internet that's it um so if a guest comes in and they want to join your wi-fi if they join your wi-fi and then they start sniffing they're just going to see a bunch of encrypted packets because what you're doing is you're using the virtual network as your real network um if you want to admit someone onto the virtual network um it's up to you to have created a structure that that can accommodate different levels of access basically the coarsest grain segmentation you have is different virtual networks you know different network IDs okay. uh, and then within a network you can use the rules engine to basically define access levels kind of like an ACL model uh, that's called tags um, or you can you know you could have different networks you could have a guest network for example that can access certain resources and then you just tell people to join it but you, um, there's mm -hmm. no dynamics uh, segmentations so I have to predefine um, different levels of security within this network yeah i mean you, you would have to set up what you want your security environment to look like because you know we don't know what that is some people they just have one company land some people they want a uh you know high medium and low security some people they want to get really fine-grained with it and mm -hmm. um but what you can do is you could set up a default access for somebody that has no tags attached to them on a network. Okay. And um, then when they join the network, if they don't have any tags, this is the kind of ACL style model, mm -hmm. they can only access maybe certain things. We have some people also that have written scripts where um, there's like a, a web app that someone can access and they can log in and then they get given some permissions. Mm -hmm. you know something like that and right now you would have to script that um things that are in our product idea slush pile of course are um automating stuff like that but we want to learn a lot more about what people actually want in that okay. department thank you mm -hmm. so we've been having some conversations around this i i love the products i one of the things that i see and i'm curious about how you guys are viewing Right. Mm -hmm. It's more adopted from a security perspective. It seems like there's some risk, um, whether it's command and control networks or bypassing firewalls. So, like SSH reverse tunnels, like this mm -hmm. is in the same vein, you know, potentially to be able to be abused. Oh, yeah. In those ways. Yeah. How do you guys kind of see that? How do you? 
how can you help enterprises and mm -hmm. you risk around that? That's a good question. Um, so the first, the first point about this is that this product is a little opinionated. It does come with a philosophy. And that is that we see the world increasingly moving away from a physical boundary to a virtual boundary. So we've gone all in on the idea of a virtual boundary. So like I said, you know, if you were going all in on this, you would just wire everything for internet. That's it. Um, you don't even really need a firewall, uh, except the, the standard you would have for consumer, you know, and all the interesting stuff happens on the virtual network. That being said, the whole world isn't going to go there at once, and not everything is going to go there. Um, that is, it's an interesting topic that I've heard it brought up twice, and it's not one that I've given a lot of thought to, so it's going, you know, we're going to take notes on this. Um, the idea of being able to detect zero tier nodes in a network, like us actually helping you do that. Um, and it could be done. It could be done. That would be interesting. That would be an interesting feature because um, because then it would enable people to see what people were doing with it in the building. Or first of all, are there any in my building? Um, the uh, the other part of that is of course, this is a product where, like a TCP IP stack, security is very critical to the product itself. Um, and like anything new, you know, I, when it comes to security, I mean, we've never had a serious incident. We did have someone find one vulnerability. Uh, it was one that was very hard to exploit in the wild and we fixed it. We have no evidence it was ever exploited. Um, that's over a number of years of this existing and millions of people using it. Um, but I'm kind of fond of saying the only secure computer is off. And um, <laughs> so it is not impossible that someone will find something with this. Uh, you know, it depends on how paranoid you are. And I'm also a fan of defense in depth. Um, one thing that I tell people that are super paranoid is, Go ahead and use zero tier for your network, but once you've created your trusted zero tier enclave, don't trust that. Secure everything inside that too. So now you have multiple hoops. Somebody's got to get access to that, and then they've got to get access to all your stuff. Don't have a soft underbelly where as soon as somebody joins the network, they have root on everything. You know that's you know unpassworded databases in the LAN, and you know I um, I think firewalls are are kind of dangerous in that sense because they encourage um, another sort of ideal philosophy I have is if it can't be connected directly to the internet without a firewall, it is not secure. Period, um, and uh, so the same way you would approach a LAN. If, if you're a company that has high security concerns, create your trusted enclave and then pretend it's not trusted and then secure everything inside too. And you will have defense in depth. And that's, that's the only way to go. It's the only way to go. Never trust just one thing for your security is what I would say. Do, do you use something like behavioral analysis or do you need other tools doing that, securing your, um, the network? So um, we actually haven't, that's a good question. We actually haven't gotten into doing anything ourselves around IDS. Mm -hmm. We provide hooks in the form of the rules engine where you can send traffic to an IDS. Um, if we get a lot bigger and uh, have demand for it, you know, we would either work with other companies, other vendors on that, make it easier for them to... Uh, to do or we could look at it ourselves but if we did look at it ourselves it would be further down the line when we're a bigger company we don't have the bandwidth for that right now so we give you hooks that you can make it talk to something else are there mm -hmm. preferred vendors you work with or you know recommendations we haven't had a lot of uh, we don't have a lot of that with ids vendors yet um i have heard a few that customers have said they use you know people um people will I usually hear names like Snort and Splunk and stuff like that. Yeah, no, uh, yeah. That's not what I'm talking about. Yeah, I, I really I'm talking about behavioral analysis, a real AI machine learning mm. in the background, mm -hmm. real zero trust technology where the behavior is con continuously mm -hmm. observed and analyzed, and as as soon as there's an anomaly detected, mm. um, mm -hmm. something happens. That is a whole fascinating topic. I love AI and machine learning myself. So um, 
uh, give us money and uh, <laughs> we might do R and D in that. So uh, yeah, any anybody that wants to sign up for enterprise, uh, anything like that, you can help us um, do really cool stuff. <laughs> That's uh, I like that idea, and in fact. Um, because the the node, uh, because everything's node centric, I would I would start thinking about like how could we build that into the node itself so every device is an IDS. I think that would be interesting. But give us money and we'll research that stuff. Okay, it's still public. <laughs> Everybody um, has heard it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Adam, I've got one more question for you. In the um, and and I hate to use the word SD WAN. I know you guys use it, but you're kind of a, you're uh, just a very different thing than an, than an SD WAN and the way yeah, you guys build yeah. your infrastructure. But reaching yeah. into the SD WAN world for a minute, one of the technologies that we've seen a lot of vendors implement, I think all of them do it now, mm -hmm. is the ability to build reliable transport for you know protocols that you want to be lossless, voice, video, real time oh, voice yeah. and video. They usually do it by duplicating the packets mm -hmm. across two WAN paths, and then mm -hmm. obviously kind of like parity. And if you you lose yeah. one of those packets, you fill it in with another. Mm -hmm. Has anybody asked you guys for that? Is that on yes. your radar at all? Um, so right now we have the uh, so we, there's three use cases around SD and S. SD-WAN that we've kind of primarily identified. One is I've got two slower WAN links. I can gang them together and make them faster. You can do that. Um, the other one is I've got a active and then maybe I've got like an LTE modem as backup. You can do that. The third one, we, we're not quite there yet, but I'm aware of it. It's on our roadmap. And that would be using uh, either just packet duplication or maybe even we might even get into error correcting codes, stuff like that. Um, and that's usually something that people want if they have a protocol that itself does not tolerate loss very well, um, which, uh, you know, that, yeah, we're aware of that. There's a whole okay. long tail, too, of SD-WAN features that, um, that we've looked at. And, you know, we want to get the core stuff working first that, you know, 90% of people want. And then if there's demand for some of the other things like... Um, I did mention this overlaps with diagnostics capability. One of the weaknesses we have now um, is when VL1 doesn't work, you have to then go out and you know do manual diagnostics. We want to make that more automatic. We could also, if we have the capability to gather more information automatically from nodes and bring them into like a dashboard, we could also work in QoS monitoring, monitoring of latency and jitter and these kinds of things as part of that. So you can not just diagnose problems, but just look at quality of your network. You that know? was actually my follow-on question was the health of the underlay. So it sounds like yeah, you guys were yeah. already thinking about, you know, we're that, thinking that about that. Um, give us more money and we'll build it. Is, is VL1 something that you guys are looking at putting into the like eBPF or something like that within the Linux kernel space or? That goes under, for us, that would go mostly under performance optimization. Right. Um, so we're looking at either that or ways we might even be able to be a kernel module, um, right. which that, that of course uh, is really good for performance because you're skipping the kernel user land switching tax that right. otherwise you have to pay.